and author of The New Abolitionists, Howard Zinn. This isn't going to be a long introduction because I think the most useful thing I can do is not to stand between you uh, and Ella Baker for very long. Uh, I do want to say it was somewhere on, a, on the streets of Atlanta, I think it was uh, somewhere in uh, 1958, 59, that I first met Ella Bacon. and it was one of the, uh, just a passing meeting. And somehow I just was with her for five, ten minutes, and yet I felt after that meeting, thinking about it, uh, that I'd been in the presence of uh, a remarkable person uh, with enormous strength and passion and hidden wells of wisdom. And then I saw her in 1961 in Albany, Georgia, at the time of the mass demonstrations there, and all sorts of things were going on out in the street, and people were being arrested, and Bob Zellner was hanging around somewhere, coming out of jail, and other people, some of them right here in this room. Uh, and in the little church in Albany, uh, back in, 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 the, in the dark, in the back room, uh, there was a line of people who had just come out of jail, black men and women, in Albany. And they were sitting there, and there at a seat at a table was Ella Baker. And while all this hoopla and demonstrative action was going on out in the street, Ella Baker was sitting there at this table, talking one by one to these people who had gotten out of jail to find out what they needed. Did they need some clothes? Had they lost their jobs? Who was taking care of their kids? They need a doctor. And it seems to me that over the years that I've known her, what has really impressed me was that on the one hand, she was always doing the nitty-gritty, uh, down-in-the-earth work that other people were not doing, while all sorts of rhetoric was going on and all sorts of grandstanding was going on. That's what she was doing, working with people and talking to people and organizing people. And yet at the same time, she always had uh, a vision, an intellectual reach, an understanding of what lay beyond today and beyond tomorrow, what lay beyond the immediate events. She always was looking uh, through the uh, things that were occupying people at the moment, uh, thinking of the kind of world, I think, that she and the rest of us thought we were working for, uh, a world without war, without racism, without poverty, in which people could live together as human beings were meant to live together. And then I, I felt very honored when she and I were both uh, serving together on the executive committee in SNCC and those first few crazy years of SNCC. And she's had a, a long and remarkable career in the South where she was born, in a North, where she has traveled and worked among all sorts of people. I listened before, as some of the messages said, that she is one of uh, the most consequential and yet one of the least honored people in America. And I thought to myself that perhaps this is because we are accepting the uh, going definition of what honor is. If honor is medals and headlines uh, and plaques and invitations to the White House, <laughs> well, that's somebody's definition of honor. And if honor is the, the love that people have for you, and if honor is the work that people do and the cause that you've dedicated your life to, then uh, Ella Baker is one of the most honored people in America. It's 
only rarely in one's lifetime that you come across somebody that you consider a truly great person. And that's the feeling I've always had uh, about Ella Baker. It's been a great privilege to know her. It's a great privilege to introduce her to you now. Here she is. Mr. Chairman and friends, I don't know if I can recall a point in my lifetime that I have been as near speechless as I am tonight. I had said that I'd had great difficulty trying to put down something to say, not only because of tonight's occasion, but because I suppose, like many people who have lived a long while, who've seen a lot of things take place, and who still want to see where we are going, I am among those who are finding it pretty difficult to, to talk these days in the first place. And tonight I am finding it even more difficult because I must admit I had not responded to this occasion in the way that apparently other people have responded. Maybe I am at fault. But when Anne asked me if the dinner this year might be quote, built around me, I said yes without any hesitation because I agreed with one other statement she made, namely, that of course this has elements of using you, but if you are like me, you do not object to being used for a good cause. And as far as I was concerned, this was it. Because irrespective of whatever else could take place tonight, to me the most important reason for being here was for some people who did not know about SCEF to learn about its work, and for others of us who have been involved in its work to gain new life and new dedication to its support. Now maybe I was wrong in taking this position. Maybe I should have let my ego find some satisfaction in the fact that, quote, I was being honored. But I must admit to you that I have always found it very difficult to play that role because in my estimation, one must do what one's conscience bids them do. And from no one, except yourself, expect applause. I have been introduced in various ways in my life. I've had the introductions, maybe I should be a little bit uh, historical or reminisce a bit. I remember when I traveled for the NAACP in the early 40s and throughout the South, I was weighing then about 40 pounds less than I'm weighing now and I was 27 years younger. And on many occasions when I arrived in a place because they, the people had been accustomed to seeing what we used to refer to uh, facetiously as be decked and be bosomed ladies. And here I appeared with neither be decking <laughs> nor not too much be bosoming. <laughs> It was pretty difficult for some of the persons who had to introduce me to find a sense of security in presenting the speaker. <laughs> and so what they usually would say after some uh, words that maybe could be said about anybody, they said, and here we have 
our national officer. And this, of course, meant that they said, well, don't blame me if it's doing all right. It's the national office that sent it. But in 59, I went down to help them in an effort to break through the barriers to voter registration in Caddo Parish, Louisiana. And among the things that we were doing, of course, was getting around to various sections of the community to try to get people to understand how they would have to, what they would have to do in order to qualify to register and to get them to come uh, out uh, to attempt to register. And on one occasion, after we had been around a while and uh, my habits, my work habits had become known, one of the dear brothering who introduced me after he asked the sister to say, ask, he said, now if this sister will give us a number on the piano, and then we will have a few words from the old workhorse. <laughs> and this was what I was supposed to represent. Now, I remember those instances, and I remember hundreds of other instances when I had the privilege of thinking, at least, that I had spoke what people were thinking in their hearts. I remember on one occasion in the height of, uh, I guess, the World war, that war that was being fought in the 40s, I spoke at a ch church in Tampa, Florida. And there were, oh, a couple of hundred of people, hundreds, two, about 200 people present. And we were recruiting NACP memberships. And out of that group, we got about 80 that morning. And one sister got up and said afterwards, she said, I'm joining because I know what this woman is saying, what she is saying, any mother can understand. Now, I wasn't a mother, but at least I was glad to know that in attempting to communicate, I had communicated with people in terms of their understanding and in terms of their drives. A lot of nice things have been said about me tonight, but I said that my main concern for being here was because this was an occasion to call attention again to the work that SCEF is doing. You've heard it said that this is the 30th anniversary of its existence. And I know of no organization that can measure its effectiveness in terms, uh, it can measure its effectiveness more effectively in terms of the repressions that have been, that it and its staff has suffered than SCEF. SCEF, as Anne has indicated, or at least my meeting with Anne and Carl came at the time when they had been uh, accused of a number of things, sedition among them, because they had bought, or bought a house, or bought a house and sold it to a Negro veteran who had been unable to buy a home out of the ghetto. And the house is, was then, I think, bombed, I believe. And the veteran and Carl were accused of having done it themselves. And I met them. I then was strictly a civil rights worker. You know, in the civil rights movement, there was not very much difference made or distinction made between civil rights and civil liberties. In fact, we may not have dwelt too well upon civil liberties in those days. And after meeting Anne and Carl, one of the things that became very clear was that those of us who were engaged, especially the young people at that time, who were engaged in the nonviolent movement, had not understood that the very laws that were being used against them, like freedom, like uh, opposition to assembly, uh, like exorbitant and unusual bail, 
These were things that had to do with the civil libertarian aspects of a struggle that they knew very little of. But thanks to Ann Braden especially, those who had not known came out of the movement, I think, at least informed, and I trust are now convinced that the struggle has to take on a double effort in the direction of combating the violations of the civil liberties that we claim to have as a result of being a part of the American system. I've often felt that the marches were just, to a large extent, outlets for people finding expression and they assuage their sense of guilt or they uh, did away with any further need for involvement by becoming a part of the march. They are necessarily, no doubt, they are a necessary part of dramatizing a situation. But why march to Washington? Why not march to Long Island? Why not march to Westchester? Why not march to the slums of New Jersey? Why not march to Harlem, to Bedford-Stuyvesant? Not in terms of a physical march, but in terms of recognizing that what is happening in these places in terms of poverty is a responsibility that has to be dealt with by those who are not impoverished. In other words, those of us who have money have got to speak to those who are in power in a way that they understand, which is how? Through the ballot, through your pressure, and through the determination that something has to be done. Poverty, war, we are pretty well on the way to at least dealing with the question of war. But beyond the question of the Vietnam War is the larger question of what kind of foreign policy does the Vietnam War represent and what kind of foreign policy will there be after the Vietnam War? Does it represent, as has been indicated in some of the things that we've read, that our government has reached a point that it thinks in terms of being the uh, policemen for the rest of the world against what they call the threat of communism? Or is it truthfully said, as some of us think, that it is the representation of the, those who are in power taking a position against the inherent right of people to seek their own self-determination in the ways that they think are best suited to their problems. Does this represent the kind of foreign policy that you and I, as citizens of this country, want to see followed? If so, that's one thing. But if not, what is our responsibility? Where does our responsibility begin and where does it end? When we come to the question of racism, this is the ticklish one. It has been said, and we must give credit where credit is due, the first to perhaps utter this were those who are now not very well received, the SNCC people when they first said that we are in a racist culture, a racist society that is dominated by a racist philosophy and an exploitation that to a large extent is based on racism, it wasn't heard. 
And now that it has been said, and perhaps to some extent documented by the report, or the president's report on uh, urban, uh, what, does it, what is it called? <laughs> urban disorders, yes. We call them rebellions, somebody calls them riots, and the president's report refers to them as urban disorders. This report comes out and says that we are tending towards becoming two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. Now the report hasn't said a thing that hasn't been said before, over and over and over again. But the great tragedy is that it wasn't heard. It was said each time there was a protest against racial segregation. It was said each time that people like Stokely Carmichael got his head beaten because he was trying to resist the racist aspects of the Southern society. And then we were much more eager for the fight against racism because of what? It was over there, it was in the South. We could always point the finger. But when it, began, when it begins to explode at our very doorsteps, what do we do? We get afraid and we get fearful. Now, it's understandable. It's understandable that you can be afraid of disorder. But that is not enough to be afraid. There is a need to understand the reason for the disorder. Not an outbreak has taken place, but what there weren't some factors that had obtained for years and years that had helped to create the climate create the hatred, create the suppressed anger that made it necessary in the minds of the people who gave vent to it the way they did, to do what they did. This, you say, is condoning the rioters. It is not. It is an effort to say to people who say they, say they would like to do something to save a country, it is an effort to say to you and to me, that we must understand what takes place on the riot, at the riot level, is a reflection of a lot of things that have not been on the surface before and that have been festering like an old sore. And what happens with an old sore when it festers? Frequently, it infects the entire body. And we are now at that stage, I'm afraid. One of the things about the question of racism that, or at least in talking to people, the question that frequently has come up recently with me is, well, we are not guilty, personally. Of course you're not. I don't know that there's anybody in this room has carried on a campaign of racism per se. But I doubt that there's anybody in this room who has not at some point been guilty of supporting a racist culture. And we must search ourselves to find out how we have been guilty. Not for the sake of just wallowing in our guilt, but for the sake of facing the fact that the future of our culture, of our country, depends not so much on what black people do as it does depend on what white people do. Now, this is a hard lesson for some of us, that the choice as to whether or not we will rid the country of racism is a choice that white America has to make. But you say that when blacks call for separatism, they are guilty of racism in reverse. How many times have you listened 
when the separatism is echoed? What's behind the call for separatism? There are many things are said, but in my estimation, there are times when the most radical makes the statement that you can't expect anything from Whitey. What he is really saying is show me. He is begging to be shown. Now how can you do it? I don't know. I wish I knew how you could show. But one thing is certain. You can't wait, sit back and wait and say, well, if the blacks aren't going to work with me, I don't want to be bothered with them. And I don't want to interfere with their receding. And if someone asks me, well, what can I do? I have only one answer. You have to do some things in terms of what you believe and in terms of your own conviction. And if you're not going to be able to be motivated by your own conviction and not wait for blacks to tell you where to move, then we are doomed. I can assure you I didn't intend this, but I listened to what was being said, and I listened to what was not said when Stokely and Rapp appeared before you. I know there was a great deal of perhaps apprehension as to whether or not things would turn out all right. I even understand, I understand that the hotel had raised questions of the possibility of riots. <laughs> and I think what took place in connection with Rapp's appearance in Maryland might be something of a lesson. He has been in jail for a number of weeks. And it was all started because of his appearance in Maryland, Cambridge, Maryland. And you remember all that was said, the story was to the effect that Rap Brown appeared, spoke, and was followed by a riot. Maybe most of us know all the details, but some of us may not. I'm going to just read a couple of lines, if I can find a way to see from the newspaper, from a newspaper clipping that deals with the question of the Cambridge riots. Before I read this, let me say, this represents a re report that was prepared by a team of social scientists headed by a Dr. Robert Shellow, Assistant Deputy Director for Research at the National Institute of Mental Health. And it was prepared for, as part of the urban, uh, the study on the urban disorders. But it wasn't included in there. We have some other documentation of it, but this will serve the purpose. To the extent that Brown encouraged anybody to engage in precipitous or disorderly acts, the city officials are clearly the ones he influenced most. Indeed, the existence of a riot existed for the most part in the minds of city officials. And to the extent that Negro disorders occurred, it can best be interpreted as a response to actions of the city officials. Brown was more a catalyst of white fears than of Negro antagonism. The disturbance more a product of white expectations than of Negro initiative. The 24-year-old Negro leader 
was indicted on charges of inciting to arson and riot. I think the report points out that the school took, the burning at the school took place about four hours after he had been shot in the arm by a deputy and after he had left. And that the people in the community really came out and tried to help put out the school blaze. But there is the possibility that the chief of police had decided that he was ready for a riot, and so help him, there had to be one. Those of us who are not ready for the burning will go down to our city halls, go down to our mayors and to our governors and even to our federal government and question why so much artillery is being bought and stacked and stopped to deal with people who are fighting against an oppressive or a repressive system that they have become victim to. The voice of those who believe that life is more sacred than property must be heard now at no other time. One other thought, and that has to do with the whole question of repressive action. I think it was this week that the 25th anniversary of the Warsaw, Gattery, uh, War Warsaw Ghetto, the resistance in the Warsaw Ghetto took place 25 years ago. Someone has said that those who fail to remember history may live to experience history. What I am suggesting is that the trend towards repressive measures against those who are resisting the war, those who are resisting the racist repressions, those who are resisting the poverty that they endure, those who are challenging a system, more and more the repression is stepped up in terms of what? Eliminating those people in one way or the other, containing them. Rap Brown was sent to jail, not because he had been tried and found guilty of a crime, but because this was an easy, he was an easy target. And if we take the position that, sure, I don't believe in that kind of imprisonment, but you must remember what he said, then we aren't really understanding that the real issue is repression. Not repression for whom, but repression against anyone who violate for who is exercising what we say are our constitutional rights of freedom of speech. Thank you.